I tell you this story. It's not a story. It's, it's really happened in 1967. At that time, the country was closed against importing anything. You cannot find a nice suit or a shirt. Everything is made in Egypt and very expensive to get. And everybody was saying, we're going to finish Israel. And I was very happy to hear about that. Well, we had uh, Arab neighbors. They were, at the beginning, of course, they were uh, fighting and they were attacking and everybody was victorious. Two weeks before the war, in the middle of May 1967, the rumor spreads and the world, even among friends. Today is Saturday, tomorrow is Sunday. After Saturday comes Sunday. After we finish with the Israelis, it will be the turn of the Christians, which is Sunday. And as a Christian, I cried. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. There have been major riots and major attacks on the churches and the Christians in Alexandria, a city that everybody thinks is safe and is, is very far from harm, is actually under siege right now. And uh, if you would just, you know, do something as simply as, as Google the term Alexandria, Christians, Muslims, persecution, you'll see all the articles coming up from the major papers about how thousands of Muslims attacked a church on this day uh, because they thought uh, Christians were preaching or they attacked a church and burned it down on this day because they thought it didn't have a permit. I mean, it's, it's absolutely amazing. And if you'll notice, a lot of these attacks occur after Friday prayers because that's where uh, the imams basically uh, incite the violence and, and, and arouse the anger within these people. Christians are seeing that once the Muslims take control, they are starting to treat them again like dimmi. The dimmitude is coming back. And a lot of Westerners are not familiar with this term. Dimmitude or dimmi is the status of Christians and Jews under Islamic rule as second class citizens. Bethlehem 30, 40 years ago was 80% Christian and today it's only about 20% Christian, it's 80% Muslim. So there's been this huge demographic shift. The Christians have fled. I do not believe where I sit here today, six years after September 11th. I do not believe Americans or Westerners in general, regardless of what country they live in, realize what they are facing with Islam. was developed and established in the context of war waged by Mohammed against the Jews of Medina in Arabia and was extrapolated to the Christians. Uh, Muslims consider uh, non-Muslims who live in a Muslim land uh, like them is. According to them, any land where a Muslim dwells should belong to Allah the messenger Muhammad and the believers, the Muslims. And non-Muslims who live there should be considered dhimmis or they are counted on the Muslims for their lives. When the Prophet Muhammad took his message to the Jews and the Christians, asking them to convert and adopt him and convert to Islam and adopt him as the last prophet, when the Christians and the Jews refused to convert, this is when he declared war on them and started killing them. And that's where the word dimmi comes, or Ahl al dimma the people of the dimmi. There is not one surat that imposed the, the dimmi condition. This was uh, created uh, later 
by Muslim theologians who interpret some surat in the Quran. It was first instituted here in Jerusalem when uh, the Muslim Caliph Omar conquered Jerusalem and made a treaty with the local Christian uh, leaders and it basically uh, placed a head tax, a poll tax on Christians and Jews, other minorities that they had to pay for Islam to protect them. Islam was their guardian, their protector. And there were many other aspects like this which made their life vulnerable and also which dehumanized them. In the Islamic thinking, once they control the capital of either your ideology or your country, once they do that, they feel they are 100% in control and their ideology controlled yours and you are beneath it. The way Christians and the Jews were forced to pay the tax is kneeling on their knees as they handed their money to the Islamic Sheikh where they were paying the jizya. So they can be felt humiliated that they are below Islam and that Islam is supreme over any other religion. <laughs> Cops in Egypt uh, live in severe persecution, maybe for 50 years now, since the uh, Nasser era, the uh, Coptic Christians start to lose some of their reputation in the country. They are being considered now as a second-class citizen. The problem started with the revolution of Nasser when he uh, seized and confiscated all the property of the Christian. And this kind of persecution started to grow up uh, by the time until we uh, reach the era of uh, Sadat. Uh, when he uh, opened his uh, terror campaign against the Christian, uh, then we start to see more and more persecution and actions against Christian. Mubarak sees himself as a moderate, but he contributed to the current crisis in Egypt by crushing down any opposition movement, by crushing down the liberals, by crushing down the seculars. He only uh, created uh, a fertile ground for the Muslim Brotherhood. And the Muslim Brotherhood presented themselves as people who are defending Islam. So the, he created a situation where the government had to compete with the Muslim Brotherhood and who is a better Muslim. Of course, it's an organized campaign plotted by the government with the help of the Muslim Brotherhood and the Jamaa al Islamiyah and the Jihad al Islam. They work as a team. The Nasser government start to move in Muslim to replace the Christian in the area. And this happened actually to uh, my father when he was replaced by uh, a Muslim uh, in his home city in Upper Egypt. Then the uh, government exiled my father, including uh, the family. I was one of them at the time. We've been exiled in the Red Sea in a desert area. We do not have any representatives in the parliament. We only have about five out of 444 members of the parliament. So we have no representation in the parliament. We don't have a voice. We have no uh, control of anything in Egypt. Uh, for example, like uh, media, TV, newspaper. Uh, Christian people doesn't have any any, they, don't, they don't own any channels, any newspaper, that anybody can hear uh, you know, our voice outside. J'entends dire par des amis chrétiens qui vivent dans des territoires qui travaillent ici, là, ils sont toujours, ils sont toujours pressionnés par la réalité. Et les gens ne peuvent pas dire qu'ils ont peur, 
elle ne peut pas même dire leurs difficultés en tant que chrétien, manifester en tant que chrétien. C'est assez, assez limité leur espace. Mais c'est là toujours c'est difficile à dire. Normalement, les gens préfèrent ne pas dire. Well, we have, we live in a small society that everybody knows everybody. We go to the market, we have Arab uh, grocery men and this and that. So if you talk, you are afraid that your property will be attacked, your house will be attacked. So it's uh, it's it's not safe. That's it. People are afraid. People they think because they go to Lebanon, they can't say. The truth. I know one lady in particular. One story of a lady in particular who had been repeatedly raped in the city of the Moor as a teenager, repeatedly raped, and then when they left her to die, they smashed her face with the bottom of their guns just come so she can be completely unrecognizable. But she will never dare come on television and tell her story about what happened to her. We are paying the price of not saying the truth. And we are paying the price of all the diplomatic codes that we have to use and this yes you could say it. this no we can't say it you know what these days are over say the truth no matter what and say it straight up front <laughs> لا يوجد شر في عز شرك أو غرب وأقبل أو أبعد وطول الزمان مما مضى وما يأتي ستجد إصبع اليهود أو الماسونية اليهودية وراء كل وراء النصرانية لإفسادها وراء الإسلام لإفساده ولكن الحب لا يحل لمسلم أن يفتح قلبه لعدو لله أو عدو لرسوله أو عدو لصحابة محمد مهما لو قطع ما يفتح قلبه ولا حبه As a dummy, you had to pay, you were forced to pay the jizya, and that is the tax, the Islamic tax that Christians and Jews had to pay. They gave them three choices, either to convert to Islam, to pay the jizya, or to be killed, to fight us back. And Christians were so peaceful, they did not fight back. So those who were rich paid the jizya and remained Christians. Those who were poor and could not afford to pay the gizya or fight the Muslims converted and became Muslims. If we would translate that into our terms, it would be kind of like having the mafia in your neighborhood and asking them, ha having them go around and ask each business for protection money. So that is that is their form of uh, extortion. So the Muslims in Egypt now are either the uh, dissidents of those Arabs who came and invaded our country or those poor people who could not afford to pay the gizya, which is a kind of poll tax that was uh, imposed on them and uh, therefore they uh, converted to Islam. And that's very un intolerable part, very expensive to any regular person to the extent that majority of the people were killed because they were not able to pay the gizya and they don't want to be converted to Islam. The economy is so bad, you know. Uh, some Christians already sold their properties, their homes, and uh, because they want to seek better opportunities, they left the country. Uh, economy is so bad, you just hardly make living when over 80, 85% of people in our area, Bethlehem area, uh, without work, without job. And these, these things really affecting the Christians more than anybody else in this land. Well, during the first Intifada, the Muslim majority around this Christian minority uh, pressured the Christians to take part in all the violence against uh, Israeli soldiers, settlers, against Israelis in general. And the Christians did not want to be a part of this. And many started fleeing. There was a huge exodus. About 60% of the Christians, let's say from the Bethlehem area, now live abroad. 
and a lot of this exodus took place during that first intifada when they were pressured to send their sons out into the streets to throw rocks and fire bombs at the Israeli troops. The Christians were better educated, they had a little more money, they had maybe had families, members living abroad, and they fled. But what started happening is that the Muslims would see Christians packing up and their houses, their businesses, their cars for sale, and they pressured the Christians and said, you must sell to us, you must sell to a Muslim, do not sell to another Christian. And if they sold to another Christian, their home was burned, their businesses were burned, their cars were burned. This even happened in the old city in Jerusalem, which of course is under uh, Israeli rule. See the difference. A church is being built and supported by the Christian believers. No money from any side. While the mosque is supported by the government through the taxpayers, so you can get free water, free electricity, and no taxes for the whole building, which should pay that big amount of money. On the other hand, the neighborhood is a house or a building for a Christian. He should pay the taxes in full, even he should be overtaxed, and should pay the water, the electricity, all utilities. There's no one, there's no, let's say, help from outside, from Christian, uh, Vatican, let's say, or other Orthodox, you know, big nations that force them or give them money or give them support. After the Oslo, let's say, ma millions and millions of money came to the Holy Land to help build the whatever was the Oslo, I don't know what. And I don't think that the bulk of the money went to the Christians, it went to the Muslims, and I'm sure about that. Because we had a small problem. We had a workshop, it was robbed, and my husband needed a sum of money to rebuild himself. So we went to Caritas. It was a big problem. They wanted this, they wanted that, they wanted this, and the money that they gave was nothing. <laughs> We are the 